Hi, my name is Bente, I'm the Norris Witch and today we will chat a little bit about seven things that I do as a heathen witch that just make sense or you could probably also call it seven things in which my heathenry practice has informed my witchcraft practice or whatever you want to call it. It will basically be seven things that I do as a heathen or a Norse pagan in my witchcraft practice that basically stem from my religion. Let's do it. Okay, first of all, using my breath and my voice for basically anything. So it actually started with using my breath to awaken spirits, for example, or to charge items with my intention. Um, and uh, I did that actually before I even became a heathen, really. But when I became a heathen, I realized that it actually makes a lot of sense that I'm doing it that way. And that's the case with a lot of things that I'm doing in my practice. So I started to do that intuitively because it just felt right. Whenever I want to, for example, tell an herb what I wanted to do in a spell, I will... My cat is chasing a fly. She caught it and ate it. Um, I'm proud of you. Uh, so <laughs> whenever I want to, for example, put my intention into an object or I want to tell an herb what to do or whatever item, I will, for example, take it into my hand, I will think of the intention uh, and I will breathe on it and I will focus on me giving some of my life's energy with my breath to this item and then under the breath I will tell it what I want it to do. And uh, I will do the same thing if I want to, for example, awaken a spirit, for example, or maybe awaken a sigil or a bind rune or something, I will give my life's energy by breathing on it. But why does this make sense? Why does this have anything to do with heathenry? So if you know about the story about how Midgard was created and how the first humans came to be and everything around that, you will know that Odin gave the two first people ask at Embla they were the first two people made from driftwood and uh, Odin gave them life, the breath of life. So doing things with your breath makes a lot of sense. Also definitely makes a lot of sense because I then later on became an Odin worshipper. So <laughs> using my breath makes sense. And apart from that, my voice in general, like breath and voice, using your voice and like incantations and stuff like that is uh, very, very important. And it has been very important if we look at uh, sources from the sagas, for example, uh, we will see incantations and we will see songs, especially in a sailor context. It's very important that if uh, Evolva would have wanted to do oracular sailor, they would have been basically sang into a trance so that they can do their thing. <laughs> Incantations, songs, things like that are just very important in a Nordic magical context. So doing that just makes complete sense to me. The second thing, actually a quite new thing that I have uh, decided to do, using mistletoe in hexes. And uh, if you have no clue about Norse paganism and Norse mythology, then you will probably wonder why the heck mistletoe in hexes, because at least I don't know of any culture apart from uh, a Nordic context where that would make sense. But if you know about Norse mythology, then you probably know that there was only one thing, one thing that could harm the god Baldr. And that was the mistletoe. And uh, the mistletoe ended up killing Baldr. So to me personally, then using mistletoe in hexes just makes a whole lot of sense. Baldr was basically the, the beloved god, the, the shining god, the most beautiful of the gods. And everyone loved him and nobody wanted him to get hurt. But this one thing could hurt him and that was just this basic little plant, the mistletoe. Uh, so because of that, I feel like using mistletoe in hexes makes a lot of sense. I have recently used it in a hex oil 
So um, yeah, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I'm the only one who does that. If there are other heathen witches out there, then please tell me if you also use mistletoe in a context like that. Because I have literally never seen it anywhere and I would be very, very interested in hearing whether that's just me or whether other people do that too. Next up, we have a classic blood. When I'm uploading this video, I probably have already uploaded my blood magic video. So if you're interested in that, then uh, hop over to that video. But yeah, blood. I use blood in a lot of ways. I use it to bless items or to bless myself. I use it to charge and to consecrate, to give life to spirits. I use it as an offering. I use it in a lot of ways. And um, of course that makes total sense. <laughs> like if you look at a very, very traditional bloat ritual, which was a sacrificial ritual, animals would have been slaughtered and their blood would have been collected. And this blood would have been sprinkled, for example, on the altar or on the participants in the ritual to bless them. In general, we also see it as uh, being used, for example, I think it was one, it's one specific... I don't know which saga it is from, but uh, wait. Was it Grechtir saga something? I don't know. I don't remember exactly, but I think Grechtir was the one that was cursed. Doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> There is definitely at least one saga source that I personally know from where blood was also used to um, charge a curse and it was very specific. It would have been driftwood. You would have taken driftwood, um, carved the curse in runes on the driftwood and then smeared your blood on the runes to basically charge and awaken them and awaken the curse and start the curse. So I personally also really like to use my blood to charge and awaken bind runes and sigils, which my sigils usually are either bind runes or magical staves. I feel like bind runes and sigils definitely have a spirit. And uh, if you give them blood, you awaken the spirit, you charge it with your intention and you feed it. I feel like it's a three-part thing and it's very, very effective. So if you haven't tried that yet, definitely try to use your blood to charge or awaken a sigil or a bind rune. I love doing that. But in general, I also really like to use blood to consecrate items. For example, I recently made a consecration oil for both myself and my shop. So maybe it's already on the shop when this video is uploaded, I don't know. But I have made a consecration oil with um, herbs that would have been very, very important to either or <laughs> the Germanic tribes and the um, pre-Christian pre Scandinavian people. So I've used herbs like that. That by itself is already great, but um, I wanted to make an oil where you can basically add something of yourself. So hair or fingernail clippings or spit or blood. And I like to put just a drop of blood into this oil and then use this oil to consecrate things. For example, rune sets or bone divination sets or I don't know what. Uh, any tool that I want to use really because I mean there's my life energy in it and it's my DNA So it creates a great bond between myself and the tool. So I love that. Also, of course, I really like to use blood as an offering Blood is everywhere and no, I don't think using blood is uh, Disgusting, but yeah, if you want to see a separate video on blood magic, then Watch my other video <laughs> next up lots and lots and lots and lots of spirit work. I feel like spirit work is one of the focuses, if not the focus in my practice. Um, not only deities, but so many different kinds of spirits. And that is actually, yeah, something that came after I became a heathen. That also came after I started deity work. I feel like deities were the first focus when it came to working with entities. But yeah, if you look at heathenry, you will quickly notice that not only deities are important, but so many kinds of spirits, like elves are very, very, very important. Your ancestors were extremely important. Um, your filkia was important. So there are just so, so many different kinds of spirits that are important. And uh, heathenry is just very, very animistic in general, like everything has a spirit and um, that just 
very very much resonates with me that is one of the many reasons why i am a heathen even before i was a heathen animism made sense to me and that has stayed like that ever since and now i'm basically working with any types of spirit like i work with deities i work with my ancestors with one animal spirit currently um, of course with plant spirits and local spirits so with my field gear <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot and um, i love that I love that very much. That's like one of my favorite parts of heathenry. Not only the deities are great, but like all of the other spirits. There are so many spirits that you can explore and work with and create a connection with. And that's just, it's extremely fun and very, very satisfying, if that makes sense in that context. Five. Five is probably quite boring because runes, of course, runes. I don't think I know a single heathen who works in a magical context that doesn't work with runes. That's kind of a given. Everyone loves runes. Even if you're not a heathen, a lot of people love runes. Runes are just great. I love runes. I incorporate runes in basically any of my workings. Um, I even work runes into magic staves with the candle back there, for example, which you can't see. Um, bind runes in general, like bind runes are my favorite. I love making them, I love using them, I love burning them, I like decorating in runes. I like runes. <laughs> I just love working with runes. I know that's such a cliche for someone who works with Odin, but um, I just love it and now it's very very bright. Sorry! Better. But yeah, runes. I won't even go deeper into that because I know that's just, that's boring. Everyone probably expected me to say runes. So let's get into, get into something else. The sun is female and the moon is male. I feel like, and I also started my witchcraft practice as a Wiccan. So I started believing or being fed the thought and the belief that the sun is male and the moon is female. That's just the thing that you learn if you get into Wicca. That didn't really, I mean, it makes sense to me still. I feel like the connection makes sense, but as a German person, if you look at our language, for example, as one of the many Germanic languages, even in the language, the sun is female and the moon is male because we have gendered articles and um, the moon is male and the sun is female. So it was always kind of a struggle. And um, now that I got into heathenry, where you also have a female sun goddess and a male moon god, it kind of gradually shifted to actually making more sense to me, especially if you live very, very far up in the north. If you live in the very north of Norway or somewhere, then it would probably make sense that the sun is female because the sun is the life giver in that situation. If you live more to the south, I don't know if you live in Spain, for example, then the sun is probably more dangerous than it is life giving. But if you're in the north, and it is so extremely important and without the sun <laughs> you wouldn't grow any crops so your fertility is very very dependent on the sun so that would have probably been more interesting to people in the north than the moon cycle making sense with female cycles i don't know it was something that i had to kind of adjust to a little bit but um now looking back it makes actually much more sense to me it is sometimes I mean, if I when I work with the planets in general, I don't really work with them that much in a gendered context. So I wouldn't look at Mercury and think if whether it's male or female. So in that way, I don't really have a struggle with it. The only struggle that I would have is if I did a ritual with other people where the moon is looked at as female and the sun is looked at as male. We will see how that develops. But um, to me, currently in a heathen context, the sun is female and the moon is male. <laughs> okay, the last one, so the seventh point, is a little bit of a cheat because I haven't tried it yet, but I really, really, I, I have wanted to try it for years and I feel like if I had the chance to do it more often, then it would become an in basically integral part of my practice. And that is uti seta, which is basically, I mean, it's translated, it means sitting out. <laughs> it basically means like, sitting outside usually during the course of the night uh, or sometimes even multiple days most often on a grave mound to basically sit there in a meditative or trance-like state 
and commune with spirits to gain knowledge. Some people did it. We have, for example, a source in one saga where someone does it to learn poetry. So there are a multitude of uh, reasons why you would do it, but usually it's something to do with knowledge and wisdom gaining. And I would love to do that. And I mean, there are grave mounds around, <laughs> but nowhere nearby where I could just sit for a night. So that's a struggle. I have actually thought about trying to adapt that to my living situation where I have a cemetery very close by. The problem is though that the cemetery is closed at night. So even in summer after 9 p.m. it's closed so I could not sit there at night. I would have to try to do it during the day and then I would have to find a place where nobody goes which is a problem because the cemetery is it's more of a park so people just go there to stroll around to take a walk or to ride their bikes or to um, go for a run. So finding a place where I would be undisturbed for a couple of hours is uh, hard, but I really want to do that. I really, really want to do that. A little bit of a cheat point <laughs> because I haven't tried it yet, but I'm very, very, very sure that I would be such a fan of it if I had the choice, uh, if I had the chance to do it. Those were the seven things, I guess. There would be more, but these were the things that kind of came to my mind when I was thinking about it. I quite spontaneously decided to film this video, so these are the seven spontaneous <laughs> points that I could think of. If you are also a heathen and a witch or some other kind of magical practitioner and there are some things that came to your mind that you do that you only basically do because you're a heathen, then um, make sure to put them in the comments because then you could inspire me and I'm always open to that. Uh, as always, patron shout out. Thank you so, so much to Lisa, Brittany, Sean, Emre, Celine, Smolketa, Josh, Virginie, Joseph, Elinura, David, Kristeny, Rixi Business, Valo, Annalena, Ashley, Glacier, Fabienne, Anna, Laura, Kristen, John, Phoenix, Anton, Jenny, Maggie, Misty, Amy, Colette, Timothy, Coffee, or the Honorary Gossip Squirrel, and Bjorn. Thank you so, so much for supporting me, honestly. You are the best. Love you. <laughs> As always, I hope you enjoyed this fun little spontaneous video. If you did, make sure to subscribe and of course give a thumbs up and ring the bell down below so that you're notified whenever I upload a new video. Of course, you can also check out my other socials or my online shop for sustainably and ethically sourced witchcraft and paganism tools. And if you want to support me, then of course you can check out my Patreon. And uh, I will see you in the next video. Bye.